All right. Well, I have the top of the hour, so let's begin. Let me welcome everybody to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you here today. We've got a great surprise guest with a very, very important topic. We have a lot to talk about. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Uh, we've been looking in the Future Trends Forum at all kinds of aspects of higher education, everything from finance to pedagogy, from libraries to politics. And one of the themes that we've been tracing has been the theme of accreditation. I like to think of accreditation as academic, academia as dark matter, powerful, important stuff that rarely gets observed or talked about. And we've hosted in the past two great accreditors. Uh, we've hosted one from uh, the Northwest Commission on Colleges and University, and we've hosted another one uh, from the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools. Now, those two associations go back a bit in time. Uh, the Northwest one dates back to 1952, and Sachs actually is more than a century old. It goes back to the 19th century. Well, today, we have the founder and founding president of a brand new startup creditor. And it's really, really interesting to see what they have in mind. So as I bring our guest up on stage, please think what you'd like to ask. What does a startup accreditor look like? What do they do? What makes them different? Why would we like to work with them? And what can we gain? So without any further ado, let me bring this week's guest up on stage. Hello, frowning President Leslie. Good afternoon. Hi. Nice to be here, Brian. Uh, good to see you. And I think we found you in Boston, right? That's right. Excellent. Excellent. Well, I'm really glad you could join us. Uh, I know your time has got to be precious as you're running around getting everything revved up. Um, we, uh, we ask every guest uh, an introductory question, and that is what you're going to be working on for the next year. And I think I've got a pretty good idea, but uh, I'm, I'm wondering if you, if you could just give us a sense of what, how are you going to be running this agency? What do you hope to achieve in the next year? Sure. Um, the next year. Um, well, first of all, Brian, thank you uh, for having me on. Really appreciate it. It's nice to be here. Um, hello to all the participants. Um, so for the next year, it will be another year of work for us in what will end up being a five, six year process to try to win recognition as an accreditor. Um, we're not actually an accreditor in a recognized sense. Uh, Brian, we're what I would describe as roughly two years into a very demanding, um, fair process before the U.S. Department of Ed uh, to develop, uh, refine um, a very extensive petition, it's called, um, to become recognized as an accreditor, which then needs to go through multiple years of review at the Department mm. of Ed. And that work is, um, I would roughly summarize as developmental work. Um, mm -hmm. We've issued draft standards. We are uh, developing a full accreditation model um, as we are required to under the, the regulation that governs new accreditors. We um, have begun with our first institution to pilot our model. It's a two-year technical college in Texas called Texas State Technical College. But it all falls, all of this work, uh, Brian, falls under the umbrella of developing um, under the influence and coaching of the Department of Ed, a petition for new recognition as an accreditor, which will go in in a couple of years and then um, proceed from there to further stages of review. Who who gets to approve um, this this new agency? Who do you work mostly work with for this? Yeah, um, I mean, I would say primarily it's the U.S. Department of Ed. Um, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a regulation, many on this call will know it really well. It's uh, section 602 really of the federal code. Um, there's, that's a regulation that actually governs um, the re-recognition of existing accreditors, which is usually how it's deployed, but it also contemplates the formation of new ones. Occasionally they do arise. Um, and it essentially has the following steps, Brian, you have to incorporate as an accreditor. We've done that, see the commission, um, begin to do the work I just described, which is draft a model, practice a model, begin to accredit, essentially be active as an accreditor, not mm. a recognized one, um, not one recognized by the U.S. Department of Ed, but be active as an accreditor. Um, and then when uh, one has done enough of that accreditation work, um, developed enough evidence and practice and so on, then a petition goes in. Um, it's reviewed first by the professional staff at the U.S. Department of Ed. There are a group of um, career civil servants there who work on accreditation. It has to then go on to something called NASIKI, which is a congressional advisory committee uh, that opines and then ultimately has to be 
um, ruled on by the political appointees at the Department of Ed, which for us will be several years down the road at least. Wow, that's a ton of work. My God, how how many how many full time staff do you have working on this? Uh, we are nine people. Um, mm -hmm. We're nine people to do this work right now, and we'll add a few more uh, staff in the next couple of years to develop this petition and to marshal it through. Okay. Okay. So, uh, and I guess some of them have some serious policy and legal experience. Um, th there is, it's a very complex, multidimensional puzzle. Uh, you're right. There's obviously law in all of this, applied regulatory law for sure. Um, and so we try to put all the, the relevant skill sets on our staff, on our board, among our advisors. Um, we are, as we'll get into, Brian, very interested and highly specialized in our interest in evaluating the degree to which students experience economic safety, mobility, and opportunity from enrolling in colleges. So a lot of our preoccupation um, has to do with measuring fairly and accurately economic returns in institutions, which is very difficult to do. Um, it's a super nuanced puzzle. So. In many ways, we're just very geeked out economists interested in measuring we'll talk about that. It, it risks um, all of your audience running uh, to go watch uh, some other more interesting web content. But <laughs> a, lot the, a lot of the puzzle for us, Brian, since the thing we're super interested in is just trying to do some pioneering work about how to really measure economic results for students and institutions in a way that is intellectually honest, empirically rigorous, and really fair to institutions. And so we can get into that, but that's a lot of the yeah. skill set. I think we should. Well, well, thank you for that answer. Thank sure. you for the answer. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, we have a very, very nerdy audience, so I think, I think you're, you're among friends. Stig, I told you the question I was going to ask you, right? And before I could put it to you, one of the crowd already put it here, even before I asked for questions. So that tells me there's an appetite for this kind of question. Uh, librarian Kate Herzog says, why would you want to establish a new accreditation? And what is your target audience? Yeah, sure. So um, good question. We, right. So first of all, if we become recognized as an accreditor um, and it's some years down the road, um, the the benefits of that or the contributions of that are they're fairly i would describe precise and in, in many ways narrow uh brian yeah. so in ways we can get into we are very particular about measuring and holding institutions accountable um via a variety of bright line tests for the wage outcomes essentially that they generate and so we will never be a large accreditor um, we will be a specialized one that i think will be um, a good fit with some relatively small subset of institutions out there. I think they're beautiful institutions. They're of a certain kind. They are very devoted uh, to producing um, economic outcomes. I'll tell you how we define that in a minute and are interested in being measured fairly for that. Um, and there's a nuance there, which is to measure the economic results for students um, of enrolling in an institution. It's of course incredibly important to pay attention to that student body because an economic outcome or really any outcome in an institution is very hard to make sense of until um, it's adjusted for the students in question. And so we'll spend a lot of time measuring institutions fairly. And we think there's a there are a group of beautiful institutions in American society that do incredible work uh, with students, often students from low income backgrounds. They're often mm -hmm. open enrollment institutions and they actually do remarkable things for the economic trajectory of these students. And to be for that to be observed for those students, for those institutions to be recognized for that it requires a lot of really solid econometrics to measure that their effect on wages. And so we think we'll be appealing to that subset of institutions. Um, Mm. specialized in that way. So that's one contribution we hope to make. Um, and then also beyond that, because we have the luxury of not having any history in a certain way, um, mm -hmm. we can, um, we're hoping to do some interesting, clever uh, work on um, wage outcome measurements um, that can be of use um, perhaps to other creditors or to other policymakers. Um, and we'll offer that freely to the field. Interesting, interesting. So, so, uh, and one, one quick question, are, are you looking at being uh, regionally bound? I mean, are you focused yeah. on the South or? Yeah. No, well, not regional. Um, yeah. That's a fading um, uh, 
sort of uh, constraint on institution, we are seeking, uh, we're seeking to become what's called an institutional creditor as distinct from a programmatic one. Um, and we're seeking to become a Title IV gatekeeping accreditor. So very high bar. We have a lot to prove. We have a lot to go through with the Department of Ed uh, to be that sort of an accreditor. But it's uh, in the parlance of accreditation recognition, Brian, we're seeking recognition, to become an institutional accreditor with Title IV gatekeeping authority for institutions that issue degrees um, up to and including the baccalaureate level. Mm -hmm. So also including associates? Yes. Okay. And, okay. and also uh, we're very interested in short-term programs that often are delivered by institutions that are very interested in jobs outcomes and the wage outcomes that we'll pay particular attention to. Okay, I'll, just two two really quick things. First of all, I don't think we mentioned the name. This is called the oh, Post-Secondary Commission. Yes, the Post-Secondary Commission, a very original name. And, and you should see on, on the bottom left of your screen, there should be a kind of tan colored box. Uh, and if you click on that, that'll take you to the web page of that. Uh, the second quick thing is Kate Herzog, uh, and thank you again, Kate, for the really good question. Uh, she asked who your target audience is. And if I understand you correctly, you're saying your target audience is institutions that want to be known and recognized for being in that kind of engine of economic mobility. Yeah. Okay. okay. I think that's, that's fair. Yeah. And um, the... Um, and maybe I'll just add a few uh, qualities to that. So that is not to the exclusion of all kinds of other outcomes in the slightest. It's just an outcome that we're particularly interested in and that uh, we think um, one can justify measuring um, uh, with some determination because it is for almost all students entering U.S. higher education. It is among the most important attributes of higher education to them. So. Um, to summarize a lot, students go to college for all kinds of worthwhile reasons. It's enormously varied. And colleges themselves are and should remain incredibly varied in their missions and the outcomes that they produce. Um, our interest in an economic result, um, really economic safety, uh, making sure that students on average um, experience wage gains that justify the cost that they're paying. Our interest in that particular outcome or that category outcome is I would describe as an interest in a core or a minimal outcome um, uh, to which there's a lot of commitment by students and uh, for which there's a lot of support also um, mm -hmm. in um, sort of the public policy substrate under higher ed and all the funding for higher ed. So we're interested in economic outcomes as a minimal or core outcome, as an outcome that can be measured as an outcome where I think if it's measured fairly and accurately uh, to institutions as one on which uh, some accountability can be built. Well, well, thank you. That's that's uh, that's a, a, a good way of, of, of describing this project. Uh, in in the chat, I, I'm just going to quickly summarize before I move on. There's a, there are a couple of interesting debates, and one of them is to what extent should higher education be measured by ROI, uh, and that's people are going back and forth on that. Uh, and another point is uh, some questions about what it means to be a creditor, and so I, th I think we'll we'll dive into that. Steve, I was going to ask you a couple more questions myself, but the but the questions have already lit up the board. So I'm just going to go over to the audience. Okay. Normally, friends, if you're new to the forum, I have to ask the audience to to supply questions. But now I have to hold you back because uh, there are so many coming up. Um, so one is coming from um, uh, Doug Weimer, uh, who is actually a Southeastern Accreditation Consultant. He's the CEO of that outfit, rather. Uh, and he wants us to ask, the value add standards that hold a position of importance at the beginning of the list of standards yeah. will be heavily dependent on accurate data. Mm -hmm. PSC supply those earnings data to institutions. Yeah, uh, thanks for the question. Um, this is a very important limiting factor in what we're setting out to do. So mm -hmm. I'll just describe very briefly um, how we intend to measure uh, wage outcomes. And then I'll reach this question of, um, the data intensivity of what we intend to do, which is very, very high. Um, mm -hmm. I think the punchline in the answer to this question, which is we will only be able to accredit an institution where in partnership with the institution, we have access to highly accurate, comprehensive wage data for students entering an institution via state data partnerships. Um, because until we get that, um, we won't be able to measure with the sort of fidelity that interests us. So let me just back up really fast. Um, in short, the thing that interests us um, as an accreditor really built around econometrics is to look at the effect on student wages of entering an institution. And so we will um, examine entering cohorts um, in an institution 
So these are students that might complete or might not, but we'll measure both types of students for their economic results. Um, and a core thing we'll try to measure, uh, we will measure with a lot of statistical precision is the degree to which the wages that they experience after they enter an institution um, are above the wages they would have experienced if they didn't. Right. Um, uh, we can refer to that as the wage gain that arises to that particular student body as it enters that institution. And if you just stop there for a minute, that's a very complicated metric to develop because it requires the estimation of a wage trajectory for a group of entering students in the absence of enrolling. That's a statistical problem in, to make a long story short, it requires us, um, you know, if there's a thousand students entering Texas State Technical College, one of our partners next academic year, to surmise in the wage records of the state of Texas and in other large data sets, what those exact 1,000 students would have made for the ensuing five, 10 or 15 years, depending on the length of the degree program they're entering in the absence of enrolling. We essentially have to go find very closely fitted control groups to try to figure out what the baseline wage trajectory is of students entering. Job number one. Job number two is then to actually observe their wages, which, of course, is very difficult to do because institutions don't have that data. Nobody on this phone call has that data. It's closely guarded by state governments, typically. And so we have struck a, a partnership with the, um, the agencies in Texas to be able to estimate the wages very accurately to those entering students. And so we can estimate the wage gain. We can literally figure out how much the wages of a group of entering students moved up or perhaps down um, after they entered. And we can also observe their actual costs so that um, we can hold an institution accountable, generally speaking, for making sure that students who enter that institution, whether they finish or not, experience an improvement in their wage trajectory, which compensates them on average for the costs they paid. So can wrap all that up in us being economists interested in value-added earnings at gains in colleges um, as this as one metric of particular importance to us. Um, and now to answer the question in the audience, there's no way we can do this um, unless we have developed proprietary access to linked, very numerous information-rich wage records um, states. And I really want to pan out here because this is where I have enormous empathy for regulators, state and federal, for other accreditors who often are interested in economic outcomes, um, but a main barrier to measuring them fairly and accurately, which means you have to be very particular to the student body entering an institution, um, is extremely difficult to do because of the lack of data um, available to any interested party another accreditor, um, a state regulator, or even the U.S. Department of Education that has only limited access to wage records. And so we are um, only interested in being an accreditor and in measuring and so on where we can do it with extraordinary fairness and accuracy, because until you do that, um, uh, it's difficult to form an opinion um, proximate to an institution about the economic um, effects that it's producing for their students. So while you're while you're working through this process of, of with the Department of Education and with Congress, you're also developing a brand new data analysis instrument. Yes, uh, we have a technical advisory board, which are you think everyone on this phone call is geeky. They're really geeky. They're uh, okay. university based labor economists. We have a very deep partnership with the statisticians at Mathematica. Okay. Um, and so this is um, we will be completely transparent about what we're doing here. In some ways, though, I will say this, Brian, that all we're really trying to bring into this use case is um, really good applied social science, um, where um, we're essentially trying to measure in really reliable, accurate, fair ways, the causal impact on wages of enrolling in a given institution for that student body. And so in some ways, outside of higher ed, this is familiar. It's um, it's social science research, basically. It's econometrics. Yeah. Um, it's and it's just very difficult to pull off um, until and unless you get very, very good data, uh, which we currently only have in a couple of states. So that's another reason we'll be very limited as an accreditor and really are trying to become one that can exemplify a sort of uh, best practice. Um, but we're very self-aware that what we're setting out to do is not easily scalable. It's not really readily available to other incumbent creditors, much less to most state policymakers or federal policymakers. So you're going to have to build this up 
for each individual state. Correct. Man, this is a lot of work. Correct. Unless there's a, a an unprecedented shift um, at the IRS where third parties, other agencies federally, can get anonymous access to uh, descriptive statistics on the wages of cohorts. I, I should describe, I should add here, by the way, we'll never see student level data in any data use agreements where we examine cohorts with large enough cell sizes so that privacy is, is completely protected always. I, um... Well, thank you for saying that. And we've had some discussion on, on, in, on the IRS in the chat from uh, one of our accountants. But, but a related question to that is, um, are you going? How are you going to be breaking out, decomposing the student population? Are you going oh, to do that yeah. by, Great. by major or by any other vector? Yes, um, any and all of the following. Um, and so, our primary or initial unit of analysis is a complete cohort that enters an institution in an enrollment period, typically an academic year. Um, and we have a standard that requires the institution on average to produce wage gains for that entering cohort, which on average are larger than the actual cost of the student's experience. And again, um, this internalizes to the institution the economic result of all entering students, whether they complete or not, and creates that's a lot of wonderful incentives, we think, for an institution, which is to increase completion rates, to lower mm -hmm. costs, to drive up wages. Um, and so the first move we make, Brian, is to evaluate those large entering cohorts. We will also evaluate subgroups of various kind. One is to look within entering cohorts by major, for sure. Um, we can also look by demographic group um, and make sure it's very important to us. And there are, we have standards that require institutions um, to uh, manage towards a world where the economic result of subgroups um, are at parity, so that we try to regulate an outcome where an institution on the average can have a good economic result, but there are certain programs or majors or demographic subgroups um, that are left behind. And we do, we go as far as we think we can do accurately without creating second order or unintended consequences to regulate the economic results of subgroups as well as full interim cohorts. So that's a lot, Brian, but the short answer is in our model, since it's so proximate to the institution and it's tracking the wages and the cost of actual students, we can look at subgroups. Well, thank you, Stig for a series of excellent, excellent answers. And, and friends, if you're new to the forum, um, my thanks to Doug, that's a good example of one of those uh, Q&A box questions. So if you have a question in mind, this is the kind of conversation that you can kick off. Um, we have we have more questions coming in and I, I, I wanna try and wrangle a few of these together. Uh, one is from our great New Orleans friend, Giselle. And, uh, and she asked a question, which I think people are, have been asking you a lot of, which is, why not work with existing agencies? I mean, there are nine accreditors, I believe. My understanding is that the existing organizations are hamstrung by the fact that the Higher Education Act hasn't been updated since 1965. Mm -hmm. How will you be different? And I, I think you've started to answer that question, right. but if you, if you want to give us a quick, uh, a quick rundown. Yeah, I, I would say informally, we will work with any accreditor. Um, again, our... Um, I think we're setting out to try to do some pioneering work, Brian, about how to measure economic outcomes. Um, and that is the hard part. If we can figure that out or model some of how to do that, we in effect would work with any accreditor. Our goal is not to accredit wow. to colleges, it's to do some development of some approaches or intellectual property then that other accreditors can take and use. And again, I wanna be very uh, deferential to them. Um, I mean, if I had, if I worked in an existing accreditor and wanted to set out to do this, I would run head first into a variety of challenges. One of them is the scarcity of data that's required to measure economic results in colleges in a truly fair and accurate way. So lots of empathy for accreditors and for other institutions. So I think the unblock here or the, the value that we can create is more about um, best practice development, about value-added earnings measurements. If we can figure that out, then it by definition will be open source for anyone to use. Oh, yeah. That was actually the question I was going to follow up with was, I mean, you, you mentioned this would be proprietary data or proprietary analytics, but also you can make it open source for uh... our methodology will be completely open source and documented um, what um, and we would encourage states, um, you know, there are places like Texas that are fairly far along and Virginia comes to mind. Some of the states that have are pretty far along in developing longitudinal data systems for students and in working with third parties that could include accreditors or researchers to try to do evaluations. And so that's a, um, that's a, 
the, the limiting factor there, Brian, is the sort of the willingness of state workforce development agencies, state tax authorities, state, state higher education agencies mm -hmm. to link their data and then also to share it with outside evaluators, including accreditors like us. Oh, I mentioned dark matter before. That's some serious yeah. dark matter. Yeah. Um, we, well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have we have more questions. Uh, coming in again. If you if you want to uh, join us on stage, friends, just click the raised hand button. Uh, we have uh, a, a few questions built on a single theme here, which is a very direct one. But I think it's because we're we're catching you at, at uh, you know before day one. We're catching you at, in in the run up. Uh, our friend in on the west coast, Mark Colbert Wilson, asks, "Who's paying for this?" Oh yeah, sure. Um, yeah, we are funded by philanthropies. Uh, we are a nonprofit. Um, we're a relatively small one, um, you can imagine nine reasonable salaries and multiply up with some whatever and pretty, get pretty quickly to what would cost to run. And we're funded by the Gates Foundation, by the Bloomberg Foundation, by the Koch Foundation um, to mm -hmm. spend these several years, five, six years to try to get recognized. Um, it's very simple as that. Um, and they're interested in this project basically for the reasons I just described, which is, um, can we get some cutting edge work done on how to measure economic outcomes that maybe other accreditors or policymakers can use and that most importantly is done carefully, is done in a way where you can look at leaders in institutions of higher ed um, with intellectual honesty and say, we didn't, we didn't wing this. We didn't show up with a little bit of data and then pass judgment. It's done in a way that's really thoughtful. Um, so that's how we're funded. If we are approved as an accreditor in five or six years, um, our hope is to remain basically philanthropically endowed and funded um, because we'll never have a lot of institutions um, that we can charge fees to. And so we hope um, at that point to um, carry a small team to carry this work on as a permanent accreditor based on philanthropy, more so than fees charged to institutions. Mm, mm, mm. Speaking of which, so, so thank you for the very clear answer. And Mark, as always, thank you for the solid question. There's a follow up from our friend, uh, uh, an accountant based in Florida, one of the great deep thinkers in, in our community who asks, uh, how, not just how is this being funded, but what is the cost going to be to member institutions? Yeah, um, I mean, right now we have, we have one member institution, just to be clear, it's Texas State Technical College. Yeah. We need to uh, find a few other partners during this recognition process. If we're approved, and then we have five colleges and universities, and then 10 or then 50, and I think that's like sort of the outer limit, um, we'll charge some fees. I, they'll be modest, um, I think, because we'll need to rely mainly on philanthropy to underwrite these costs. We, we are a, this is another indulgence that we have as a small and startup accreditor. So we're going to be, um, we're going to be a costly accreditor internally because we do all these econometrics and all this data work. So I think in the end, I think the way to solve that is to get foundations to, to fund this. Um, we, I don't imagine charging heavy fees to small portfolio colleges to fund this work. Okay. Okay. Well, well, Glenn, thanks. Thanks for the uh, very foresightful question. And uh, thank you, Stig, for, for, yeah. that, uh, for a really, really good answer. Um, we have a, a video question coming in from our, our good friend, Brent Anders at the uh, American University of uh, Armenia. So let me just bring him up on stage to join us. And hello, sir. Good to see you, Brent. Hello. Great to see all of you. So my question, and this is kind of similar to what I asked the Undersecretary for Higher Education a couple of weeks ago, and that deals with everyone's favorite topic, uh, AI. So I've worked with a couple of different uh, accrediting agencies, and I've also tried to research different accrediting agencies and looking at their specific standards. I know you were kind of looking at the, the, the big picture, but I'm, I want to zero in now on some of the specific standards. And what I found is that there's nothing, absolutely nothing dealing with AI. Uh, I know that AI is a technology that should be looked at as far as preparing students, but Basically, AI is kind of the technology now in that if we're talking about making sure that students are competitive and able to get good jobs, they need to have AI literacy skills. They need to be able to properly compete. So they would need to develop these type of capabilities. So I'm, I'm very much looking for accreditors that are starting to understand the importance of AI literacy and starting to incorporate that as an actual standard, because if 
and again, this is why I asked the question to the undersecretary. I'm looking for different mechanisms to help educational institutions realize its importance and then actually implement. There's yeah. so much talk about this, but there isn't enough implementation because everyone's doing this wait and see. Let's continue to do research. But again, these are capabilities and skills that students need right now. So yeah. I'd love to get your ideas so on that. Is, um, Brett, let me sure I understand the question, which is whether how active or prescriptive will we be in our standards and our policies and procedures around AI? Is that your question? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, not at all. Not at all. And and let me let me kind of zoom out for that. I there are I think of universities as, first of all, incredibly varied. There'll be extraordinary universities in America 15 years ago that don't have any technology in them. I can think of some right now that are clinically based, that are relationship based. There'll be some that are deeply tech enabled, everything in between. Um, by the way, remember, some will be two year and four year institutions. Some will have deep, they'll have enormously varied missions. They'll have different kinds of faculties. They'll have all kinds. So in other words, it is an intervention called a college and it has an enormous variety to it. It always will. First of all, I think therefore our job as an accreditor is not primarily to design a college in its particulars. Um, it's to put some guardrails around that to make sure mm -hmm. that what's happening there is consistent. It's logical. It passes some basic reasonable tests um, around the means. Um, and you can tell where, where we will head, which is um, we will be much more particular about these economic outcomes as a basic delivery that every institution should promise to all entering students in exchange for access to public subsidies. Um, and so go back to AI. Now, I will tell you as a civilian, um, I am hopeful and a little worried about what's going to happen uh, with AI as any technology. But the experts to figure that out will be the institutions. And I'll say one last thing, which is that within reason, and so long as an institution is producing clear, measurable, strong outcomes, including in particular the economic that one I just described, I think we ought to try uh, to give them reasonable discretion to specialize, to innovate, and to change. And to sort of, while Regulation, means regulation, has a very strong role to play. It's a big part of federal law. It's a big part of Title IV and FSA, which we incorporate in many ways as an accreditor, at the same time to leave universities to do their job, which is to figure out what role, if any, AI will play, for example, um, in the years to come. So um, we will not spend any time prescribing to universities how to use AI. Um, I think that uh, that's not where we will be experts. Um, but I, I think, and I think, so that's a, I think where I would summarize that is we want to be, we want to sort of develop a model that is particular about certain core outcomes that almost all students and all policymakers left and right can agree on, which is these basic economic mobility and safety outcomes. And then beyond that, after we've made sure that they meet basic regulations, many of them emanating from FSA, um, to beyond that, um, give them some freedom to specialize because they are so varied and because students want so many different designs and so many different outcomes in addition. Okay, thank you for your perspective. Yeah, appreciate it. Brent, as always, thank you for that question. Um, and uh, Stig, I really appreciate your uh, straight up answer and then uh, the detailed uh, breakdown of that. Uh, again, Fred's, if, if you're new to the forum, that's uh, obviously an example of a video question. So if, you, if you'd like to follow Brent, you neither have to be as well dressed as him nor as bearded as me uh, to, to be on stage. Just press the raise hand button. Uh, in, the, in the chat, we have a, a, a torrent of information. And just really quickly, uh, folks in the chat, uh, would you object if I, if I um, anonymized you, uh, extracted some of this, and posted it as a blog post? The amount of resources here is, uh, is, is superb. Uh, Glenn McGee is giving us detailed links to uh, all kinds of um, good reports. And Marta just gave us a link to a very, very nice uh, resource from uh, AQ about AI. Um, Marta, I hope I pronounced that correctly as, uh, as, as AQ. Um, and we have, we have more questions coming in, Steve. This is just nonstop. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and we, we just had, uh, we, we had a U.S. discussion so far. And then uh, Brent took us to uh, Central Asia. But now we have a really, really interesting uh, European perspective. I'm going to show this to you as two questions back to back because it's 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 a kind of it's a uh, it's it's a little lengthy, but I think you, you'll you'll see what I mean. Uh, this is from our friend uh, Phil Lingard in, uh, in in Malta, and he begins by saying the European higher education area has a single regulator, ENQA, overseeing 47 national accreditors. So that's the setup. Mm -hmm. uh, and then he asks this this really 
solid philosophical question, practical question. What are the benefits of having competing accreditors? Mm. So in the U.S., why add, why add uh, your commission to be number 10? Why, what, yeah. What's so good about yeah, I, mean, I think there are 42 federally recognized accreditors right now. Um, it's, it, uh, don't quote me. That's right. Um, wow. Don't quote me on how many of them are institutional versus programmatic or Title IV gatekeeping. So we're not really altering the number uh, nor the dynamics oh, yeah. uh, between accreditors in the U.S. Um, and I think... Um, it's a, there's a, a just to be philosophical about it. I think there is a hard question, which is what's the thing an accreditor or really a state regulator or a federal regulator should demand of an institution, if anything. And we are taking a sort of cautious view there that um, you, if you measure it well enough, um, an economic outcome is something that could be the basis for universal accountability to all institutions. Um, to then quickly add that they can then go on and produce all manner of other outcomes in collaboration with students. Um, and I think, um, so I would be, I think we're obligated at PSC to be in favor of some basic measurement of an economic result um, in an institution because in exchange for the public subsidies that go in there. Um, beyond that, and I would encourage that if data systems would allow it one day in state law and among accreditors. Um, and I think after that, there can, there are, of course, going to be domain expertise among some accreditors that don't exist in others. And that's a very natural, the programmatic accreditors play a big role in that, of course. Um, and so that might be one partial answer to this, maybe less about competition among accreditors and more just expertise in accreditors. This is certainly true with the programmatic accreditors who obviously come in in specialized fields often uh, to, with standards that are particular to that field. Um, those are my reactions to the question from Malta. Well, thank you, thank you, uh, Philip. That's a, of course a really, really good question, and thank you for bringing the the European perspective. Um, I'd like to continue on a European theme, although nominally not so European now, uh, by bringing in one of our good friends from Britain. Uh, and this is the start of a couple of uh, philosophical questions, uh, and and this is one from uh, the wonderful Doug Belshaw one of the world's experts in digital literacy, as well as collaboration and open education. And he asks a straightforward question. As a philosophy graduate, I'm a bit concerned about the focus yeah. on ROI. Yeah. Should I be? Yeah. Um, I don't know if you're asking me whether you personally should be worried about um, your your wages as a philosophy student. Um, I'll ref I don't have an opinion on that one. Um, but there is a delicate issue here, which is that there are some majors within an institution that are highly aligned with strong wage gains and others that are not. And the ones that aren't are particularly in the humanities and non-selected institutions and the liberal arts fields. Um, and so we've thought a lot about um, the question that I think everyone thinks a lot about, which is if you put pressure on institutions in exchange for federal financial aid or even state aid to give an economic result back to students, how do you not overreach on that and allow also yeah, yeah. for institutions to ship majors that interest yeah. students and or that society needs, which aren't um, as productive economically? Um, Allied, certain allied health fields, teaching often, social work and so on, and also philosophy and French literature and so on. And I think to make a long story short, we tried very hard to balance that. And so that um, this would be a longer conversation, Brian, but an institution could thrive under our standard without every single degree always and forever producing very high wage gains so that there is a tolerance for an institution meeting the needs of students and in some cases society also for producing these majors. Um, there is a separate dynamic, which I'm al always quick to point out on all of this, which is that whatever we might want on this call or whatever university administrators might want, students overwhelmingly will favor majors um, that create economic safety and mobility for them. Um, that's what all the data says. So um, there is this underlying reality that there's a labor market out there and it's beyond the reach of institutions of higher ed to influence. And sadly, in many cases, maybe unproductively for society in many cases, the economy will underpay in certain sectors. Um, that's a reality largely beyond, I think you can't change the wage uh, structure of various sectors in the labor market. And so students, it's gonna be, we cannot have a situation is all I wanna say where we press students into majors that they might enjoy. 
but which they actually don't want to pursue. Maybe, they, maybe they're reluctant in that choice, but they won't pursue it because overwhelmingly 80, 90% of students will report that if they're gonna go to college and spend the time and the money to do it, um, they have to, this is true in most cases, uh, create an economic future for themselves that's improved. And so um, universities, are we live within a labor market that is as it is. So there's some nuance there, Brian, and to the questioner. But again, back to our accreditation model, we're not doctrinal about uh, wage premiums. Um, we do think we can measure them within reason and still try to leave room for universities to deliver majors that are, um, that are less um, rewarded in the labor market for all the reasons I described. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that's a good thoughtful answer. And, and of course, you you did describe yourselves as a, as limited in, in scope. And so yeah. perhaps some institutions might uh, position themselves, Doug, from a more uh, maybe pro philosophical point of view, if, if, if we will. Um, we have a we have a follow up question uh, to that. And this is from um, our, our classic friend, uh, Tom Hames, uh, coming to us from the Houston area. And uh, he, he breaks this question down of ROI to a different level. Uh, wages are driven by the value employers assign to the product coming from those colleges, i.e. graduates, but they have a poor understanding of what differentiates graduates. Mm -hmm. How do you address this issue? Yeah, um, so I'm not sure I, I think I know what Tom is asking me, but Tom, come yeah. back if I've misunderstood. So I certainly agree with the premise, employers, um, have a what I would describe as a low information hiring problem. Mm -hmm. um, they're searching for a certain profile, mm -hmm. just a question of whether their profile is distorted or suboptimal in some first place, and then they have little information, let's call it, on who meets that profile or not. Um, I think that's a correct description of the hiring market, including for college students finishing up. Um, the the, the, the next question over, maybe most pertinent in this, is what does a competent college do about that? I think might be the question where you're headed, Tom. Um, and I think, and then how would we encourage that behavior in an institution? So a competent college noticing this problem will do, I think, any of the sort of commonsensical things that we can think of right now, which is um, be transparent about their skills and knowledge that are that's endemic to their curriculum and to their majors and to their programs um, at some high level within reason curate their majors so they're aligned uh, to partners pa uh, employers partner with employers in their locality or region and so basically um, try to work on this problem by uh, offering education to students that fits with employers and being transparent about the skills and knowledge strains and standards within those degrees. Um, now, all the way back to us as an accreditor on the outside watching this, um, again, I would not, we will not be an accreditor that micro-regulates that practice or those sets of practices in the institution, um, though I will freely encourage them. What we'll rather do is go back to this uh, metric that I described to you. If we ask institutions to produce wage gains for students that beat their alternative and their commensurate costs, it creates a very natural, um, we think, optimal set of incentives for institutions to simultaneously increase their graduation rate, because all of the things being equal, that helps to lower their costs and improve their wages. And there's another nuance there, which is we would find it very hard to specify a particular graduation rate or a particular degree cost or a particular wage outcome as good or bad in isolation. Because oh. we really do have to look at all of it um, sort of in a synthetic way, as we're going to try to do with our value added earning standard to evaluate colleges effectively. So the short answer to this one is, I think, a sub, an optimal college will try to solve this problem. And we, as a kind of arm's length um, accreditor, will try to measure the college in a way that encourages decision making and design innovation on this issue. Wow. Well, Tom, uh, Steve, Tom has a, a genius for asking terrific probing questions. Um, and that was that was no exception. And, and Stig, thank you for that very, very thoughtful meditation on, on the question. Mm -hmm. It's only this is such a, a, a data a data house you're going to become. You're going to oh, sure. Yeah. So just to go back to the genius, Tom, Tom, I just saw in your text, you asked us about soft skills. So let's yeah. stipulate that soft skills are incredibly important to students. Um, I'm certain of that. Um, they're important to employers as well. Um, by the way, they're very hard for institutions themselves to even measure. There's a long conversation about that, but educators K through 12 and in higher ed will often agree 
that soft skill X, Y, or Z are excruciatingly important. They'll nominate them as a goal, but they'll struggle very hard to observe the presence or absence in that soft skill, to observe changes in the absolute level in the student of that soft skill. You can literally sub in any soft skill you want. So I think I'm just describing uh, the challenge that good educators face. We as an accreditor then wouldn't help matters much if we showed up and tried to specify a particular measurement tool for a particular soft skill to anoint one soft skill over another and so on. Um, but good educators, including institutions of higher ed, will productively struggle with that. Which soft skills should we prioritize? How do we program against them? How do we teach them? How do we assess them? And I think our primary position as an accreditor will be to encourage that very nuanced work that is to be done by educators, um, and then to try in a sensible way to measure an output. And that's this wage game that I've described, which will benefit if they solve that puzzle. But it's not something that we have enough self-confidence to micro-regulate, Tom. I think it's something that's best left to the professionals who run an institution. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Steve. And, and Tom, as always, I, I appreciate that very much. Um, we have a, we are almost out of time. Uh, so we have time for, I think, two more questions. And we've got one coming in, uh, for a follow-up question uh, from uh, uh, Doug Weimer. And this is a, a detailed question that he wants to probe a little bit more on. And uh, he asked a good, a good follow-up. The annual audit process <laughs> is interesting. Yeah. Is that standard every year? Yeah. This yeah. would be an advantage over a longer cycle. However, reporting and evaluating reports would be onerous on the scale. Yeah, right. Well, Doug, thanks for it. Sounds like you've gone to read our materials. That's always pleasing. Thank you. Um, I'll put a caveat about all of this, Doug. Remember, we're basically one second old. We have one institution. And so we will evolve, we'll refine what we're doing over time. But yes, you did notice that we imagine a, an annual auditing cycle with a small number of institutions. Tom, this goes to a luxury we'll have as a a creditor determined to be staff heavy and small so we can do mainly intellectual property work and best practice development. But yes, in addition to um, sort of longer full institutional review cycles, five and seven years in our case, uh, depending on setting, we'll also have an annual auditing process that's very collaborative with an institution. Um, and this is for another call time, but we'll try very, very hard to rely on primary material produced by the institution. So not report specified by us to lower the transaction costs of that engagement and to have staff on our side that can really carefully monitor and track the institutions. And again, wherever possible to rely on information that they produce internally in the ordinary course of business for us to do our monitoring work so that we lower the transaction costs. Uh, but we do want regular contact with our institutions. And the last thing I'll say is all of the econometrics that I described that we will do, we will do with Mathematica. Um, we will do based on these data partnerships. It's um, it's too demanding and technical work for most institutions to do themselves. Um, it definitely sounds like that. Um, thank you, uh, uh, thank you, Doug, for following up on this. Um, I, I hope we are hitting a good uh, geeky level so far for you, Steve. Um, <laughs> we, uh, we have a, another question from uh, our good friend in the Northeast at Northeastern University, in fact, Charles Finley, um, who uh, turns back to the ROI question with a particular yeah. angle. Uh, how does the cost of the degree affect mm -hmm. the overall RI measure? Mm -hmm. If the graduate pays 50% of their income compared mm -hmm. to another student with no debt payment, how is that factored into the analysis? Yeah, great. Um, um, I would say that the, the answer is it's one of the primary drivers of an economic result. So I'm sorry, was the question from Northeastern? Is that where? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I'll so, um, I live down the street from Northeastern, a big fan. Um, and I think I'm... I have a pretty good mental model of what it costs to go to Northeastern. And so that number then for a student to pay that number in our model, it would have to get paid back adequately in the form of cumulative wage gains. Let's assume it's a bachelor's degree student entering in. Um, they enroll for four years. Um, they paid a certain amount of money to get that degree. We would then look at the bump in wages that that student would experience for 15 years after enrolling in Northeastern. Hmm. Um, and um, that is the so the cumulative wage gain over a 15 year period following enrollment um, that then has to make some sense on average compared to what they paid. Now, notice the nuances. If you were to raise tuition at Northeastern, all the things being equal, that will challenge the ROI that students experience. But if the wage gains go up more then the tuition goes up, no problem in our model. 
Um, I also put another thing, which is where a student drops out at Northeastern, having spent three years um, paying tuition at Northeastern. Um, that's a dangerous circumstance for many yeah. students and will track the wage gains uh, of that student and the cost will be sitting there and that will be factored into the averages that we run. Um, so you ask another question, which is how do we handle the fact that some students, um, the students come from really different um, households um, and different income levels. And so that the tuition they pay or the cost that they experience, the net cost they experience, can be a radically different percent of their background wealth. We don't actually take that into account specifically. Um, uh, that's probably a limitation or a design choice. What we do instead, Tom, is we look at those students at Northeastern, 500 students, let's say, entering, actually, I'm guessing it's 1,500 students entering Northeastern proper this next academic year. We'll look very carefully at who they are. If we could get access to the wage data in Massachusetts and other states, we would forecast with a high degree of precision what would have happened to them if they didn't enroll in Northeastern or, or attend higher ed, then we'll watch their wages. Um, we'll do the calculation from there. So I'm hoping somewhere in that geeky response, I answered the actual question. Uh, I think you did. Uh, Charles, let me know if you want, if you want to follow up uh, on that. Um, as, as the host, I'd like to assert my privilege for one question uh, myself, which is, to wonder what does this look like in uh, oh and charles says this is fine he, he just chatted that so it's fine um what is uh what does this look like in about 10 years so mm -hmm. 2034 both yes. uh, I'm, I'm curious roughly how many uh universities and colleges would you like to have a uh, accredited or under your accreditation mm -hmm. uh, rubric by that point yeah. And also, what, is, what does this do to higher education? What kind of impact does it have? Yeah, sure. Um, so again, if we're approved, call it four years from now, um, and then in another 15 years go by, Brian, I'm, I'm more worried about having almost no customers than I am having, I'm, and we're hopeful we have some of them. Remember, we're going to be a fairly labor-intensive accreditor around the data stuff. We'll only be able to operate in very data-rich environments, and we will set bright line standards about economic outcomes. So for institutions to come voluntarily to us, they'll want to be very proud of their economic results. They'll want to be measured for them. And like I said, our working theory is that there are some institutions that enroll very, very generously, um, that enroll vulnerable students um, that come from low-income backgrounds and do enormous, incredible things for them to create economic mobility and safety for them. But to be observed for it, they have to be measured in these input-adjusted, highly controlled ways that I just described. We think that'll be our clientele. I don't know if that'll be 10 institutions or 50 institutions, but it will not be 500. Um, and we are not also in any way associated with whatever the dust up is in accreditation about accreditation switching. Um, we are not going to be a magnet uh, for all the reasons I just described for institutions that are for all the, the, the controversy around it. We have literally nothing to do with it. We're an accreditor born out of an interest in measuring fairly and accurately the economic outcomes in colleges. We want to try to do clever pioneering work around that stuff um, and then to offer it up to policymakers and other accreditors should it be useful with a really deep acknowledgement that the only reason we can do what we're doing is because we have the luxurious problem of having, almost, of having no incumbent institutions and being able to pick states where we can get the data to work with. Oh, fascinating, fascinating. You'll be, you'll be quite an entity at that point, and uh, and and you'll have uh, you have uh, elevated higher education uh, to some. I hope so I might also be 150 years old by the time we get there, Brian. But <laughs> yes, I I hope to be back. Um, and I just also want to thank everyone on this phone call. We are new. We have a lot to learn, and uh, appreciate all the questions and chat and a uh, chance to describe a little bit what we're about, Brian. Well, thank you, Steve, for taking the hour to uh, answer all these questions. Um, it's been a it's been a real pleasure. Uh, we've learned a lot, and we really appreciate the peek behind the curtain before you know uh, things uh, uh, finally come out on stage in full. Uh, we'd like to have you back in, in a few years to to see how things go. Um, thank so, you. Well, one quick question is: How do we keep up with you? How do oh, how do we keep up yeah. with your progress? We have a website. I think it gets like two visitors a month. It's called the postsecondary commission um, dot org and uh, the right track there. is there. We got a link to it right there. Well, excellent. Well, thank you so much. Good luck with this. And uh, thank you again for being a great guest. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. Have a nice we'll day. Bye-bye. Well, friends, don't uh, don't leave yet. Um, I do want to second um, 
uh, uh, Stig's praise of, uh, of all of your uh, excellent, uh, uh, excellent questions. That's been a real pleasure. As always, uh, you all make for a very, very good conversation. Let me just quickly uh, add, if you'd like to keep talking about these issues, all the different implications for accreditation, strategic, philosophical, uh, please keep, keep us Keep going with this. Uh, we have, of course, the hashtag FTTE available for you. Here are some handles where you can find me on Twitter, Mastodon Threads, Blue Sky, and, of course, the blog. Uh, if you'd like to look into our previous sessions where we talk about accreditation, uh, we as well as other issues, here's a link to our archive at tinyurl.com slash FDFarchive. Uh, if you look to look at our upcoming sessions on everything from the paradigm conversations to AI and education to enrollment and reforming grading, just head to our website, forum.futureofeducation.us. And again, thank you all for uh, thinking together and exploring this new innovation and this new entity with us. Uh, it's always a pleasure. I hope you're all well. If you're in the Northern Hemisphere, I hope you're enjoying uh, summer as it comes. Uh, I hope you're all safe and sound, and we'll see you next time online. Take care. Bye-bye.